For the past several years, the noted Catholic scholar, Dr. Janet Smith, has served as the primary caregiver for her mother, who suffers from advancing dementia. That experience has both sharpened Dr. Smith's understanding of the Church's teaching on human dignity and given her new insight into the witness of old age. Join us today as we discuss those insights with Dr. Janet Smith, who holds the Father Michael J. McGivney Chair of Life Ethics at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement here at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, joined by our regular panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology, also here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, who holds the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan University. And uh, we're joined by our special guest, Dr. Janet Smith. It's so good to have you here. You uh, hold the Father Michael J. McGivney Chair in Life Ethics at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. You've earned your BA at uh, Grinnell, your MA in Classical Language from the University of North Carolina, and a PhD in Classical Language from the University of Toronto. Uh, you're the author of Humanae Vitae, A Generation Later, and of The Right to Privacy, uh, as well as the editor of Why Humanae Vitae Was Right, a reader. I know you from, probably first from uh, the, the famous talk, uh, <laughs> uh, Contraception, Why Not? Uh, you write widely on a number of subjects and speak nationally and internationally on Catholic teaching on sexuality and bioethics. Uh, it is such a joy to have you back here on campus <laughs> in Steubenville. Um, so today we're talking about aging, um, mm -hmm. and uh, if you could just kind of frame it for us a little bit, what what does contemporary society look at uh, when they think of aging, when they think of the aged, and maybe you could just give a little summary of, of where we're at in our cultural understanding of. Well, a, a big point is that our culture tends to think that human beings are valuable insofar as they are productive, what they right. can do and how they can perform. And that if you're not, uh, if you can't do much, on uh, aging often can't, aged often can't do much, then they're basically considered worthless, and they feel worthless. Right. I mean, other cultures have, uh, in our culture at various times, have seen the the, the elderly as fonts of wisdom, right. and that, and even if they weren't, in a certain sense, couldn't convey that, they still represented um, another period of time when things were different, and you always just look at people like that, and you, they they embody, they really embody something, and that's the Im important point that the. The person and the body are one, and it's not like the person has gone. The person might be a little bit less accessible right. because of the what, how they're functioning at this point. Yeah. So you, we have a culture in, in which celebrates youth, celebrates uh, celebrity, celebrates energy and productiveness, right. and so the aged uh, seem bur they're a burden and they're they're rather worthless. Yeah, so they don't have productivity. They're not uti you know utility for us. So, so how does that kind of understanding, that cultural understanding, affect the way we care for them, the way that we see them uh, and treat them? Well, the worst, of course, is a, a sense that um, assisted suicide and euthanasia would be justified. That right. uh, people are just they're not worth anything, and so you might as well just ease, you know get them out of here. Um, of course, the other part is that we warehouse them, and it, it's not it's not altogether fair. I mean, there are times when it's it's right and necessary to put someone in a nursing home, uh, but I think sometimes that's done too quickly and done at the convenience of those who perhaps should be giving some care. But many of those places are very good, and sometimes it's much better for the person to be in that environment. But I think there's often a sense that you know, time to put grandma or grandpa in a home so that we can get on with our lives. Right, so it's all about us. And it's, it's all about, about us. And part of the problem is not just that they're unproductive, you know, because along with productivity comes beauty, you know, comes fun. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're strong and beautiful or funny or productive, then you're, you know, you're worth much. Mm -hmm. You're not worth much if those things. And plus, I think there's also a factor that when you are aging, you, you feel it yourself. And I think mm -hmm. there's a sort of discomfort level, not only in the part of society, 
but are the part of the people who are sort of, you know, there and not feeling like they fit in. And this has been a problem for a long time. And with the breakdown of the family, this has really yeah. brought it about. But I remember back in around 1980, it was the Colorado Governor Lamb mm -hmm. who made that famous statement about the, you know, the duty of the old people is to die, you know, get After out of the way. After 65, yeah. I believe yeah, it was. 65 right. was I mean, it was wow. shocking, <laughs> but it's not shocking anymore. Yeah, he just well, kind of moved standard. the bar, as it were. Yeah. You know? An another problem is that it is a kind of a, a catering we do to, to children. You know that, that we're trying as hard as we can to make their lives fun and yeah. worthwhile and everything, and to think that they might have to sit with grandma for a period of time that would, might not be so pleasant. It's too much to ask. Right. Yeah. And uh, again, I'm finding I'm taking care of my mother now, and uh, for a good part of the year, and I've got nieces and nephews, and once they learn how, once they learn how to approach her and to talk with her, it they love it, and right. and then you can see it spills over. Uh, one of my nieces helps me with my mother now and then, and, and she went on a youth mission to Pittsburgh, and she was the best at sitting with the old people um, when they would the group would go f fix their homes. Well, a big part of that is to sit and talk with the person you're helping, yeah, yeah. and yeah, she knew it, how to do that. It's oftentimes, I, I think, simply a function of being in mm -hmm. a kind of companionable silence with those who are old, who have been on a journey, uh, and maybe they've grown quite simple. Uh, even witless. I don't think you can exaggerate uh, the, the, uh, the difference between the present age and its attitude towards the very old with earlier ages that mm -hmm. I think yeah. had an instinctive regard, even reverence uh, for the old. Uh, uh, Pope John Paul II in that wonderful text on how do we treat the elderly cites the Roman poet Ovid mm. uh, who, who says, look, when you have gray hair, white hair, you become an object of veneration. Right. So you, you should be genuflecting before <laughs> me, uh, I think. But the watershed you know, between the two periods, I think, is very instructive. It's, it's a defining feature of our age, yeah. this impatience with the old. They're not productive. They're not functional. Maybe they should just die right. uh, in a convenient and unobtrusive way. And, and that attitude, I, I think, is so destructive, so insulting to human life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really undermines everything. And then as you, you know, not that this is the only cause because our society as a whole is already going there, but you look at the more we socialize healthcare and medicine, they're not only a burden on their families in some ways, now they're a burden on society and mm -hmm. governments. And, mm -hmm. and, and there's going to be all these incentives possibly mm -hmm. to... Mm -hmm. yeah, the media is going to reinforce that. There's no doubt about it. Besides exciting Ovid, St. John Paul also cites wisdom literature, which is just right. chock full yeah. of this attitude that you honor the hoary head. You know, the, right. the silver hair is a crown for the aging. Right. And, and this sort of attitude, I think, is, is something that Catholics especially need to recover and then to do their best to sort of be the leaven in society. Right. But I think we need to recover it because yeah. I think we've been so affected mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. the secular culture, the media, and all the other forces. It, it well. really requires, I think, a certain imaginative leap of sympathy to see in that person who looks so inert uh, and uh, insensate, supine, wisdom, uh, value, mm -hmm. dignity. There's something imperishably rich mm -hmm. and precious about this person, I even if, if they're reduced to a kind of gibbering. Uh, uh, nonsense yeah. uh, in the advanced stages of, of senility. They, they possess a, di a dignity. They've mm -hmm. been on a long journey. Well, I, I found, especially for, I'd say, my generation who, I mean, we didn't grow up in the Depression. We haven't had a lot of real hardships um, that aren't in my generation. We're, I think we're responsible for a lot of the irresponsibility and, and, yeah. and I say, stupidness of our, our, our culture. And I'm now about three years now I've been uh, for half a year taking care of my mother who has dementia. And I feel it's just God's um, <laughs> giving me a chance uh, to grow up hmm. and, and to learn how to care for another person and to see the person still in there, as you say. And the, yeah. I mean, to some extent, my mother's a bit like, I mean, it's, you know, she, she's still, she's very present in the moment. She still has a, an unbelievable wit, but she can't remember if she had lunch or what she had for lunch or yeah. what I'm telling we're going to do next. She, that she can't remember. But any, just like you might treat a small child, you, you get little presents for her and she delights in them. Wow. You know, and you, like at night I put a, a heated rice sock in her bed and she's just like, oh, 
you know, and, and this sort of thing is you just you just say this is a person, and we know how to delight persons, and you just don't stop. You try to the same way as I see parents. They're, they're thinking from morning till night, especially for their little ones, how I'm going to show them a good day, how I'm going to make sure they have a good memory today. That's mm -hmm. what they're, they're they're that's what they're thinking. Right. So I'm thinking, well, why? You know, I could take this as a burden. I could take this as how am I going to last? Which sometimes I certainly do think that, yeah. but but a lot of it, I just have to think about what would delight her <laughs> and. Yeah. What do I need to do? And you get a lot of laughs and giggles when you when you do that. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, just to think that I mean, again, it, this is a as a person who mm -hmm. deserves and demands and needs and and loves and can be loved. And well, I, I'm the other day she was having. She doesn't have very many meltdowns, but I was leaving to go back to Michigan. She has a little bit of a meltdown, and you know, she wasn't feeling worth anything. I just keep trying to tell her. I said, Mom, you can't imagine. I'm a I'm a way better person than I was th three years ago. Mm. And if I hadn't had this opportunity, you know, I would just been getting more and more selfish and stuck in my ways. And God's given, as I said, another another chance. And one story I love is one day I took her to, this was three years ago when she had not declined as much, but she was still, she still certainly had the dementia. And I took her to Eucharistic Adoration, which is not something my mother um, was accustomed to doing. I actually gave her a little something to read and she didn't, didn't touch it. And the whole time she was just totally intense on the sacrament. And uh, we walk out and I said, Mom, I said, did you like it? She said, oh yes. And I said, what did, did you learn anything? She said, I learned I still have a purpose on this earth. Wow. Wow. Was right, you <laughs> wow. Know, wow. And I'm thinking maybe this is something we need to do a whole lot more yeah. with uh, people with dementia is we think, you know, going there, they're not getting anything out of it or going to mass. And it's, you know, of course, at mass, she still, she knows all the songs. She knows all the words. So all of that, she feels like she's a full participant because mm -hmm. that's what you don't forget. You don't forget what's been a part of your, your deepest being. Years ago, I went to visit a friend of mine some you might know her, Ann Muggeridge, and she mm. had very early onset um, dementia, early 60s. And I saw her, maybe she was 67, and she was just, you know, really out of it. And I started saying the rosary with her, and she, big smile, wow. and wow. she was going with a rhythm of it. And the doctor came over and said, what are you doing? We haven't seen any responsiveness from her for the longest time. I said, because it's in her it is. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, that's yeah. very instructive. My mother-in-law, mm. uh, her mind is sort of like uh, the village square when it grows <laughs> empty at night. There's no there or there. She doesn't know my name. She doesn't know yeah. her daughter's name. Yeah. But one day when we asked her if she would like to pray the rosary, mm -hmm. she perked up uh, yeah. and took flight. She knew all the words. Right. And a certain warmth of ardor uh, possessed her. And that was very freeing for her. I mean, the, the Pope speaks about the nature of modernity as not having a memory anymore. And yet her memory uh, is, is rich and vibrant and it's, it reaches all the way back into her Catholic childhood. Now, I think the, that will be the last to go. I yeah. think that praying, uh, uh, you know, when I finally caught on to that, as you said, saying the rosary with her, you know, it's just every night, Mom, what would you like to pray for? For my family. So exactly. for my family. Yeah. Wow. And, and you can just tell at the end of the, the rosary, she feels she has really accomplished something. Right. That's so great. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's well, and, and in thinking just, you know, probably with your mother, but I, I know a priest that I know well there, having in the same conversation multiple times where I repeated the same topic, <laughs> but, but even still they I have that memory. Enhanced interrogation <laughs> is what I call it. <laughs> You know, that loss of memory that you speak of is, is really important um, because, you know, on the one hand, they changed our diapers. It's the least we can do, you know, right. and if we forget that, shame on us. On the other hand, we tend to forget the fact that they're sort of like prophetic mirrors of what we're going to be mm -hmm. in the future, right. too. Right. And if we remember the fact that, you know, what you sow is what you reap, you know, we ought to be showing respect and, and reverence. And in, in, the, in the same context, hoping that this is going to continue for us right. as well. Right. I mean, our culture is overly pragmatic, but strictly on pragmatic grounds, I think right. we could get people to revisit this and rethink mm -hmm. it as well. Yeah. I, I jokingly say to my children, you know, I, I fed you and changed your diaper when you were young, so get ready in the future, you might have to return the <laughs> right. favor. Right. But, but there is so much more that the church teaches mm -hmm. about the dignity, the wisdom, the place, and the mm -hmm. purpose. I mm -hmm. mean, I think that's so key. The redemptive suffering, too. Yeah. The fact yeah. that what they're doing, what they're going through, has redemptive power that redounds to our benefit, yeah. even if they're not conscious in some ways, I right. think especially because but, they're not yeah, conscious. Scott, you're, you're, you're spot on. It is 
in, at the deepest level, sort of self-serving to care about yes. the old, to extend uh, some compassion in their direction, because you're going to be there shortly. They represent a kind of memento mori. Mm. I, mean, I, I think of, of, of Bergson, the philosopher, who said, to live is to grow old. And we all grow old. I mean, right now we're older than we were when the program began. <laughs> it, it's that long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you don't learn anything from that, uh, then I, I, I think uh, you're already dead, but nobody has told you. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people are, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, stay with us on Franciscan University Presents as we continue the conversation with Dr. Janet Smith on aging. Toward the end of my term as a member of the Provincial Curia, we were sort of on the loose and ready for assignments. At that time, my mother was beginning to fail. She was an old age. She was in her late 80s, and, uh, but she didn't have any trauma or anything. She was just old. So I really did not want to put her away somewhere. So we provided some care for her, but it was inadequate and it was not caring. And so I decided to do my best to be uh, a caregiver to her. And for several years, I took care of her and while I was stationed in Philadelphia, officially. Uh, what it did for me was, I think that when she passed away and I came back into the order, I think I was a much better religious because of that experience. People recognize Franciscan University as being academically excellent and passionately Catholic. We have the unique opportunity through our faculty members, through our students, to proclaim that academic excellence by reaching out in many different ways. We also remain passionately Catholic in the way in which we are able to worship, the way in which we are able to uh, bring that love of Christ to others on a daily basis. It's important for us to be able to embrace both. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're talking with professor and scholar, Dr. Janet Smith, about aging. Um, you kind of shared a lot in the last segment about your mom and some of the experiences you've had. You teach ethics. You teach on the dignity of the human mm -hmm. person at, uh, at Sacred Heart. What impact has the last three years in, in caring for and witnessing uh, and being with your mom affected, influenced, gave you new insight or uh, perspective? It's, it's, been, it's been amazing, honestly. Um, because, it, it, I, again, I'm a single person, I haven't had children, so I, I haven't had that, since I was a teenager, did a lot of babysitting, I haven't had that experience of really having to care for someone for an extended mm. time. And just, you know, it, just all the demands that a person can make on you, you know, right. the meals, um, you know, taking her places, etc. But I would say, just watching how it's been beneficial for the whole family mm. as well. Uh, that it's become it's a family effort, and so there, I have uh, five brothers and sisters, and everybody tries to do what they can. Nieces and nephews, that the nieces and nephews watching the adults really mm. take this on, and you know, I'm thinking about you know the church is teaching the, that the family is a school of love, mm. and I'm thinking that's what we're we're teaching, and not you know I'm back at living in the same town with my both of my sisters, and you know, there's all sorts of interesting family dynamics whenever sure. you have this, and that's that's three years of intense. Um, family dynamics uh, <laughs> yeah, for for myself and others, which has been very healthy for all of us. That we're all concerned about mom, and so we, even though we might differ politically and religiously, we've come together in a new way hmm. in our in wanting to do what's best for mom. And just have, you know, people call up and say, "Have you tried this? Or have you thought of this?" Or just this. Everybody's thinking about what we can do. Wow. Uh, much more intentional about that. Unity much more. Intentional. And... She's very vulnerable, and. It, 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 um, Reed just said earlier, I mean, it's trying to understand and watching every day her world reduce and how mm -hmm. vulnerable she is. I mean, she knows now, she, for a long time, she said, you, don't, you guys won't leave me alone. In fact, very, very early on, a beautiful statement, she was sitting on the porch and we were all hovering around her because she had recently fallen. Now, she was still quite with it at that time, but, you know, sitting there and saying, she said, you know, my life isn't what it used to be. Mm. She, used to, I, she said, I used to be independent. I could do what I wanted. And now everybody's watching me all the time. There needs to be somebody with me all the time. She said, she said, I know it's for my own good. And I love you dearly. She said, but I can have an attitude about it if I want to. That's right. <laughs> that sounds so much like my mom is right now. She's 87. And it's interesting because she's still strong and healthy, but she knows that won't last forever. Right. You know, she's bowling and she's golfing in the summertime and taking walks and all of that. 
But what I've observed that's really been instructive for me is uh, our kids uh, who have driver's license and, and, and busy lives really enjoy not only coming to visit when she's here in town, but driving out to see her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know exactly why, but I think Kimberly sowed the seeds for this a long time ago when we lived in Joliet and our oldest kids were really young. Uh, we were homeschooling, but she would take a, an afternoon at least once a week to go to a house for the elderly. Mm. Mm. And she wouldn't just go and visit them. She would take the kids. Yeah, it's big. And, uh, you know, and it was the one woman in particular week after week for months and months. And she would just, she just perked up. No, she really came back alive, you know. Mm -hmm. And the circle of her friends in this, in this uh, home for the elderly also. And more recently, I just uh, found out from my daughter-in-law that my oldest son, mm -hmm. who's 32, doing doctor work at Notre Dame, has asked her, and finally she agreed, somewhat reluctantly, to gather up the kids and once a week on Saturday, you know, drive across town and go to this house to visit all of the elderly. And well, well the, the, you know, they have these four kids all under five, you know, it's gonna be a burden to the, it's like life-giving, it's, it's spring like Christmas. time. Yeah. It's It is, and my daughter-in-law blogged about it and described how she resisted it, and then she did it, and then it's changed her life, it's changed the kids. It cha you know, and it's like astounding, uh, the wisdom that you get. And it's not just caring for your own, it's caring for others, mm -hmm. and sometimes just being there or bringing the kids along is life-changing, even for the employees at the institution right, who right. see it. Yeah, yeah it, it shows life, and it remembers yeah. they're a part of that, that family, that bigger family, uh, and that they do have value. And unselfishness, and too. You know, it, yeah. I think it, it's, it, it's self-perpetuating, yeah. you know? Well, if, if the family is the school of love, then what you're describing is an extension of that principle, right. the logic of love. It, mm. It's diffusive of itself. It, 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 it longs to share itself with others who don't have love. And then you discover that you are enriched by this donation of, of self. And, I mean, it's the whole paradox of the Christian life. You only get what you give, and you get more when you give. Yeah, uh, and that's, right. that self-emptying is the prerequisite. And I can't imagine a, a more telling example than young people going to visit, you know, superannuated ancients. Uh, and, and just being with them. I mean, our kids, we, would use, we used to take them to uh, old people's homes, and they would play their, their violin. Right. Uh, I mean, introducing Mozart into a setting like that is revolutionary. Uh, and and th their faces would be wreathed in smiles. I mean, the sense of joy that you communicate, it, it's infectious. And the children would come back. Uh, revitalized by by that. It wasn't a sacrifice. And if you don't know Mozart, do it anyway. <laughs> I played, as a teenager, I would take my guitar and play the Allman Brothers. You know? And they never heard what of it, but they you? enjoyed it. I, I prefer Mozart now. It must have been a great the... torment for them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they offered it up. But they never no told you. <laughs> but, but in these three years, and I know many probably would experience this, there was a lot of sacrifice. There was a lot mm -hmm. of suffering. And, 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 the, and even the, yeah. the standing with your, your mom in mm -hmm. her own suffering. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, from, from Facebook and other places, we see that, that you found some joy in all of this. Um, can, can I unpack that a little bit? What, 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 I mean, because you, you're, you're, yeah. you're going through something that's very difficult. I mean, you know, as, as great as it is to give ourselves away, uh, how did you find joy in these challenges? Well, it, I mean, I have to say, I think my mother is one of the easiest ones that I know. I mean, mm. she's full of gratitude. From morning till night, it's thank you so much for being here. I'm I'm wow. so appreciative. It's so wonderful that you. Sometimes she has no idea. Like <laughs> you, can, you, you can you can stay as long as you want. She tells me. Yeah. You know and, and <laughs> so, okay. That's... And uh, you know it's just like I came yesterday and maybe I could stay a little longer. And, and she, <laughs> um, it, and she uh, again she's just constant gratitude. And she's just funny. She's she says funny things all the time. One day, um, and it's just a light to sort of capture these and share them because one day uh, she goes out with a caretaker, a beautiful woman named Lynn. And that's another great part of this is the people you meet. Hmm. Uh, the people who do this kind of work are beautiful people yeah. that, that are caretakers. And then you hear people's stories. You have a bond with people that's just amazing when you start, people start telling you their own experience with their right. grandmother, or their yeah. grandfather, and what yes, it yes. meant to them. And that's been very, very enriching. Yeah. But one day I was talking about the, the questions. Uh, she was saying to the caretaker, I really want to go home. My daughter's there. I'd like to spend time with my daughter. 
And the caretaker said, well, you know, the problem is you just ask her questions all the time and she can't get any work done. And my mother always says, well, I, I, won't, I won't ask her any questions. Yeah. I'm just going to sit and read. So it, it, I, I'm sitting, you know, I'm intent on my computer doing something. This little face comes, you know, and it's always these questions. You know. And it, usually it's just, it's a it's hundred times the same yeah. thing. Don't you think the print is too small on this? <laughs> yes, it is, Mom. I, why do people print things that sm small? I, I, I don't, it's not good, is it? And then An she, hour later. <laughs> no, two, no, no. Three minutes, but less, two minutes. She gets to the door, she's forgotten. She just asks me. She sees it again and she comes back and it's under my nose. You know, again, when it goes on until finally, sometimes I do this, give that to me. <laughs> and other times I say, Mom, I think it's, I think I'll just, why don't I just put this over, over here? This is just causing us a little bit of trouble, yeah. isn't it? But it'll take a little bit while before it starts. But anyway, she said to Lynn, she said to Lynn, she said, uh, she said, I'll just go sit and read and I won't bother Janet. And Lynn says, well, you, you couldn't go, you couldn't go 10 minutes without asking 10 questions. And my mother says, I could too. And so they start talking. And after 10 minutes, my mother says, it's been 10 minutes. And I've only asked eight questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and at that point, you say, I've been duped. She's just been playing with me all along. But, she has that mischievous uh, side. To oh, it's character. very much there. Oh, and, and again, I think it's part of an atmosphere we have created. You know, that we, we have tried very, like the nieces and nephews. At first, it was just overwhelming. You know, the same questions, same statements over and over. And I said, no, you have to... You have to come in and just, just, you know, hello, Grandma. It's so good to see you. You're looking so good. My, one of my six foot two, fifteen year old nephews. He's just a beautiful guy. And he just gives her, "You're my sweetie. You're my little <laughs> sweetie." You know, and she just lights up. And then I said, "Now, if she starts asking too many questions, look at me." And I say, "I do something." And she likes this. She just go. They say, <laughs> and she says, well, why don't you just let Clark tell you about his day? Why don't you just, so you have to learn some techniques and yeah. then you have to teach them to the young. I, I had to learn all these myself. I had, I, my, had a lot to learn. There was a, one mm -hmm. book I read called um, Learning to Speak Alzheimer's. And it was fantastic. And it's most, a new language almost. It's a new language. But it was, it's, the, it's the language of love and it's something we all should do all the time, which was basically affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. Mm -hmm. Every minute you say, if she sets the table, well, you did a beautiful job setting the table, Mom. You know, and you just constantly, it's it just everything, because they feel so worthless and so unproductive that you have to, everything, um, thank you for that, thank you for thinking of that. Um, I, you know, that really helps me, even though it takes you twice as long, five times as long. This is where everyone lying is not such a bad thing. But, um, <laughs> so your ethics have been. My, my ethics have been brought right into this. So there, there's all of those things. You really learn how to, again, live for another person. You're, you're, you're focusing on their state of mind. You need to be cheerful for them because they need the good cheer. Mm. And you need to figure out. And then, again, the, the kids see it. And they just, they pick that up. They want to imitate that. Yeah. Mm. You know, the element of humor is something mm. also that my mom has commented upon. Not making fun of them, or, or, yeah. you know, but, but laughing at the situation, right. you know, and just bringing light to the situation. And, you know, my kids were especially good at that with puns that they have to explain or whatever things that happen. And, you know, I have, a, I have one son who's 6'5", and uh, mm. when he goes to visit grandma, and hugs her. She'll talk about it for the oh, week. It's, <laughs> oh, it's exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a, a beautiful uh, little vignette that uh, showed up on YouTube some years mm. ago featuring uh, a very old man, obviously sunk uh, in senescence, and his son. And they're, they're sitting together on a bench. Right. And the son is reading a newspaper. He's preoccupied with the paper. And the father keeps nudging him to ask, what is that bird up in the, uh, the branches of the tree? And the son, uh, it, at least initially, is patient uh, and good humored and, and tells him. <laughs> but the father keeps asking over and over. And suddenly the son grabs the paper, throws it on the ground, and screams at his father. You know, it's a damn bird. Right. At that <laughs> moment, the father, I mean, he's, he's, he's reduced to silence sure. and shame. But somehow he has the presence of mind to go into the house and fetch a diary that he kept when his son was a little boy. Mm -hmm. And he comes out and he reads the passage to him when his little boy was asking the same question. And he, he indicates, he had indicated in the diary that my son asked me this question 38 times. Oh, yeah. And I always told him what it was. At that instant, I mean, you have metanoia. The son and the father embrace. It is, it's overwhelming. That's what the old 
can teach us. They teach us wisdom. They teach us peace. Patience, Patience. And, oh. and humor. Yeah, there's no one that's not taking care of someone that doesn't have that kind yeah, yeah. of a, 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 an epiphany at some right. point. Yeah. That you know, uh, you would answer a toddler's question 500 times, <laughs> but you get you get annoyed with your your mother who's doing it. My right. mother has the most amazing way with me. Like when I'm becoming sarcastic or impatient, you know, I I will uh, you know I'll often I have to, I apologize a lot. You know, mom, I'm so sorry. I've been impatient. I'm so sorry. She'll say, "You're just wonderful." You're just wonderful. Oh, yeah. And even before I've apologized, she'll say, you're, and, I, and then I catch it. You're so wonderful. You know, <laughs> wow. it, 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 it really isn't passive aggressive because she really does think I'm wonderful. And she, some of you I'm so sorry for you. You have to put up with this. Yeah. You know, but I'll say things like, Mom, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, and then that I'm so impatient and sometimes mean. She'll say, don't talk about my daughter like that. Wow. My daughter's just wonderful. Right. Yeah. Or I'll say, Mom, you're, she'll say, you're wonderful. Say, yeah, but I still have a lot of rough edges that need to be smoothed. <laughs> she'll say, oh, we even love those rough ed edges. Yeah. So she's got these sayings. Right. And you know, I'll say, I'm so sorry I'm crabby. She said, who cares about crabby? <laughs> so it, it, she, so the great. wisdom there is that yeah. she, sees, she sees how hard it is for me. And she's right. teaching me. She's not you know, pouting. She's not sulking, which she would have every right to do. Right. Um, you know, to say, why aren't you nicer to me? She could say that. She has never said that. And even if so, she does, she'll be teaching you then. Too. Yes, yeah. right. Well, in, right. In light of that, I mean, you've already shared it, but what, what is the, the most important lesson uh, that you've learned in this from your mom? For me, it's, it's simply being other-directed, is, yeah. is really um, saying, when I get up in the morning, you know, I live by myself. I, you know, I have my coffee, I have my breakfast, I read my whatever at the morning, I have my quiet prayer time. Well, now it's like a dozen times, um, I'd like some toast. It's coming, Mom. <laughs> you have my toast yet? Mom is coming. Right. <laughs> you know, come here, look at the birds out the window. Mom, I've seen them. No, but they're really pretty. Come on, come on, Janet. But I thought you wanted your toast. So I have to, you know, it's all, it has to be that. You know, so my, my little, I enjoy my own thoughts. I enjoy my own world, my little space. And now I, I can't live there. I have to live for in, the other. In, in, for the other. Oh, that's beautiful. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. I was involved as a co-producer of a public television documentary a couple of years ago, and we looked at different types of dementia, not just Alzheimer's. And what we found over and over and over again were instances of families that have had broken apart because of the dementia that their loved one had. But the person is still there. It's a neurological problem. It's a disconnection on the ability to communicate but it's important to stay together and continue relationships because the person that they love, the person that you love, is still there and knows that you're there. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. This entire program springs forth from the very heart of our campus here in Steubenville, Ohio. Uh, this uh, recording is happening in our communication arts studio. Our students are operating the camera and equipment here at Franciscan University. Uh, our, our, our regular panelists, our theology professors here at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. Uh, we've been talking with Dr. Janet Smith about aging, about your mom, and the particular very personal experiences you've had. Um, but, but as a professor, as a, as a scholar uh, of, of theology, if you will, um, how has your experience uh, with your mother uh, influenced or affected your understanding of the, the church's liturgical, sacramental life, uh, or just the church in general? Yeah, okay. This might be a little bit oblique answer to your, your question, but um, Scott asked me earlier, he had heard I'd, I'm a consecrated virgin, which I have been for three years, and it's actually the period of time that I've been taking care of my mother. So I, wow. I feel it like my divine spouse said, this is what you need, wow. and, and he's right. Um, but uh, certainly calling upon his help, um, more and more knowing I'm not in this alone, and mm. so that I'm at the end of my rope. Huh. You know, and, and I have found, I mean, that part of the, what you're supposed to do as a consecrated virgin is to uh, do the read the liturgy of the hours, and so sometimes when I'm at the end of my rope, I just get myself in another room and read part of the daily uh, readings. Mm. And after that, I have much more clarity, much more ability to, to go ahead. I I can't get to daily mass when I'm staying with my mother, and the times that I do get there, it's just like you know before I took it for granted, and now it's just like 
whoa, this is, you're just washed with grace. And it, it's, it, it is the sense too that, I mean, this consecration, I mean, it's, he's waiting for me. Glad you showed up. That's glad, right. glad you could get here. Yeah. Um, I felt that some before, but this is even in a sense um, more profound. So those, the, the reality of the graces that you get from the church uh, through the liturgy of the hours, through the liturgy itself that, that help you and that you're not alone um, mm. in this. And again, the, I'm on Facebook a lot and the number of people who've been doing this and the sort of, it's a great community for solace and support. People wow. will pray for you and they, they become very fond of my mother because of these little anecdotes I tell. That's great. Well, I, I don't think it's disconnected. <clears throat> the most important lesson you learned in the last segment, you talked about your other centers, giving right. of yourself, and that you, in this three-year uh, time where you've been serving your mom, mm -hmm. you found the vocation of consecrated uh, life. You yeah, know? it's and been, it was, yes, it was very much, in fact, it, I was consecrated on her birthday, which was a very nice oh, little coincidence. But the, yeah, in the, that you're not alone um, and that the graces are there. And sometimes, you know, you, the day looks very long. I, you know, I, I'm living in a place I haven't lived since I was 18. I, you know, I have sisters, but um, not many friends, and it's a, they, they look long. And then you just turn it over to God and you say, you know, I know that you can do wonderful things. Yeah. Uh, and and they, it does happen. Yeah. Beautiful things happen. Yeah. I, want, I want to tell you another sort of, another story about my mother about just hearing sacrament. Um, again, three years ago, uh, when I was starting out, I was going to confession. And I said to mom, would you uh, like to go to confession with me? As if she has a choice, she goes where I go. You know, and, and as being the typical Catholic, she says, I think I just went, which <laughs> she has no memory of when she last went, but it's, it's hilarious. My kids use the same line. Yeah, yeah, I think I just went. I said, no mom, you didn't. I'm going anyway, so come with me. And she said, well, Janet, I, I don't know what I would have to confess. My, my husband's been dead for two years now. Hmm. Now, come on. That's good. That's good. Right. He's married He's no longer that. an yeah. occasion of yeah. sin. No, that's right. What do, what do right. spouses confess? Except right. I've been impatient with my spouse. That's I've been right. critical of my spouse. You know, crazy. well, I don't have a spouse anymore. To, to, right. yeah. And then she she said, and I said, then me, me, me. I said, well, you know, you are sometimes critical of your daughters, and she said, but never sinfully so. <laughs> and here she was exactly right. So it's it's those those funny things, and you know, there's there's not a lot of sense of her going to confession anymore because she can't. Re and she's good as gold. I mean, yeah. she's I I don't I don't the think she's there. I think she's yeah. sinless. But you know, you're a professor of moral theology, bioethics, mm -hmm. end of life ethics, and all of that. And I think we always assume that moral instruction comes primarily from, from the legal tradition. Mm -hmm. What I love about the Old Testament is that when you look at the Torah the law, the mm -hmm. Pentateuch. The first book of the five is Genesis, mm -hmm. and there are no statutes. Right. There are only stories. Mm -hmm. And they usually begin when the patriarchs are in their 70s, you know, like Abraham <laughs> right, 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 and Sarah. Right. And, 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 you know, you might think, well, that's just a disconnect. That's not really law. But the Jews have never thought of it that way, mm -hmm. you know. Well, it's unrelated to the legislation you find in Exodus or Leviticus and you know, Callum Carmichael has done a, a brilliant job of, of showing how the seemingly random laws that you read about in Deuteronomy or in Numbers are actually commenting upon the foibles of the patriarchs and matriarchs mm -hmm. in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And suddenly when you connect the dots, you're like, he's right. Mm. You know, that this immoral instruction is not derived from some abstraction. Right. It really is drawing from the lessons that you probably didn't learn but should have mm -hmm. from your parents, your Other grandparents, stories. and great-grandparents. It's a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it also connects not only that part of the Torah with the other, but that part of our life experience with our instruction, with our teaching, with our study, and that sort of thing. You know, somebody once asked, uh, why are there so many people? Uh, on this planet? And the answer is because God loves stories. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's a multitude of stories <laughs> right. and we find ourselves inside his own story because our stories are not good enough. They're not adequate. Uh, they can't bring us to a state of closure. So God enters the story and makes it his story. I mean, the, 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 the teaching moment that you have when you deal with your mother is nature isn't enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the merely human is inhuman. I have to draw upon a higher source. Mm -hmm. And if I plug in, uh, I may amaze myself at the extent <laughs> of my kenosis, what I can do for those I love. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, whether it's the bravery, adoration, confession, getting to mass, you know, or something else that God sends you. I mean, it really is yeah. the truth that we need that divine grace right. just to that be That couldn't human. do it without it. Yeah. I, I, but it's so and charming that... you know you need that. <laughs> it's yeah. in, it's right. entirely uh, enchanting, I think, that your mother doesn't have to go to confession anymore. 
I mean, no. she doesn't have a sense of sin. She hasn't she, violated I mean, the I'm commandments. I'm with her 24-7. Honestly, right. she does not sin. Right. Yep. I mean, I sin, you know, yeah. more than on the hour, on the hour. Right. You know? <laughs> but it, it meant, as you were talking about patience before, I, I'm sorry to, so many stories, but um, her knees have become wobbly and she needs to use a walker. But my mother is fanatically neat, which I am not. Mm. I am, I like it, everything open because I might need it sometime. Yeah. And um, so, but, so I put a walker by her couch and her notion is that she doesn't, it doesn't belong there. So she gets up and she takes it way to the back of the house and leaves it there and hobbles back to her couch. So one day I put three walkers <laughs> by her couch because right. there's gonna at least be one there when she needs to get up. <laughs> and I was out of the room for 10 minutes and one was way back in the laundry, the other was way the other direction in her bedroom and the other was hidden in a corner in right, the living room because right. they all have to be put away. Now. When that first happened, of course, I'm walking to the other side and crying out loud, I gotta go walk and get that walker again, you know, and just like, Rawr. you know, uh, can't you remember to keep the walker here? You need it, you know, and then you say, what's the point? Right. What's yeah, the point yeah. in that getting angry? She needs the walker, so I have to go get it. Right. But why not just sort of sing on your way there and sing on the way back and make a game out of it for her, you know, well, here's your little walker delivery woman again, you know, and so she laughs and she right. knows what's going on. So learning, you know, at first it was just, I was just kind of getting myself angry and, and out of sorts and she hears that she knows it here's your here's your walker here's your walker again you know you know we think about the challenge that the young have in coping with the old mm -hmm. I, I think we need to flip it uh, around the old are challenged by us oh, she right. has to cope with you she has to cope you, you with may yeah, be impossible to it. live with that's right, that's right. Uh, you know, so there is another set of circumstances though that I've run across where caring for the aged caring for your parents involves caring for someone who is sort of tipped the other way, mm -hmm. where there's a mean streak, oh, where yeah, there's a darkness, sure. where yeah. there's a depression, where there's constant negativity. And I would say, you know, again, from a slightly academic angle, that, you know, even if uh, they don't want to go to confession, or even if, you know, you've got to be careful and assume that just because they're mean, they don't necessarily have the moral no. apparatus no. to be really responsible. Right. And I don't know who's watching right now, but I can't help but wonder if somebody who's watching is sort of deeply jealous of oh, you and jealous. your mother. Yeah, you know, I'd be jealous. And yeah. thinking, you know, not only is my temper mm. lost all the time, but so is my mother, or so is my father. And I think it's helpful to remember that, you know, at that point in life, you know, it's sort of like a child throwing a temper tantrum before the age of reason. Sure. You know, don't draw, you know, don't that, don't put it on a list for a later confession when they mm -hmm. finally get to their first confession, because there isn't that sort of intelligibility yeah, necessary I think that's for right. it. I think she's yeah. guiltless. That, that is a very good point, because not everyone is blessed with that occasion. Oh, I'm so um, blessed. Um, yeah. and, uh, but, but that's a challenge. I mean, it's a challenge either way. Uh, but yeah, she, I mean, your mother different. sounds positively beatific. <laughs> you know, I, she yeah. is, and this is another point. I mean, I've had a couple friends come to visit me to give me some relief, and um, they have had very bad relationships with their mothers. And being with my mother has been healing for them. I see. Mm. see for them to see a, a loving mother-daughter relationship, to see a mm. mother that's always affirming when she could be scolding. Sure, I mean, I right. deserve it, and she doesn't do it. And so, it, for them, they've said, "I can't, I can't tell you what good it good did for me mm. um, to be there to to see that." Yeah. And so, it, you know, God it brought them to heal them in a sense by, by allowing them to be. So she has no idea she's doing that kind of thing. Yeah, and sure. recently she's, um, very recently, she started talking nonstop uh, in her sleep, in her wake, waking, and she's hallucinating. She thinks someone's in the room, she talks. And my sister, who's staying with her now, I mean, it's very, very exhausting, but my sister said, I, I don't want to go to bed, she said, because she's saying everything she says is so sweet. And it just, again, it just shows you the sweetness that she's always instructing people or helping people. You know, I hate to think, when my, again, all my filters are down, what it's going to be like. You know, it's just, you know, like, well, how do you do this? I mean, I'm trying now to get nicer because I figure when those filters go, we're, gonna, we're in big trouble. But, um, <laughs> but just seeing the healingness that that kind of sweetness can bring people. Um, mm. Even though it's, you know, it's not really so directed or anything, but it's just it's there again in her being. Yeah. I hear you have a talk called The Theology of the Old Body, right. uh, and I think it's a DVD now. What right. is that, and how can people find that? Uh, I have a, a website, JanetESmith.org, I think, or MyCatholicFaith.com. Uh, both, the, you could get to it through there. 
because I put these little vignettes on the on Facebook, uh, the, the organizers of the Theology of the Body Congress last year invited me to talk. And I said, what do you want me to talk? And I said, well, we want you to talk about your mother. And I said, well, you know, all I've got are stories. And they said, just tell those stories. So I actually had 159 <laughs> slides. Wow. I got up and I said this. Wow. And I said, you know, I, I figure when I look up at the end, there's going to be nobody but me. And that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. You know, that's okay. So I just told these stories. And people just laughed and cried and laughed and cried. And then some young man came up to me about almost four to five minutes after I'd done talking, because there'd been so many people coming up to tell me their stories. I said I wanted to hear them, and they're all so touching. And this mm. young man's crying. He's about 21 years old, crying. He said, I said, I'm sorry, I'm crying. I said, why are you crying? He said, well, you made me realize how much I appreciate my mother, and I've never told her. So I've just spent the last 45 minutes writing a note to my mother to tell her how much I love her. Wow. So, again, you know, so that's all what comes through this, you know, you know is that... that as a but professor of moral sure. theology, you know the importance of developing arguments right. for the pro-life causes. You know, at the same time, you know the limitations of the arguments. Mm -hmm. You know, we use two words interchangeably: rational and intellectual. But I was rereading Peeper's *Leisure: The Basis of Culture* recently for the umpteenth time, and he points out that in the Middle Ages, you know, people like Saint Thomas distinguished between ratio, rational, and intellectus, intellectual. You know, that, that the ratio is sort of the instrument of discursive reasoning, proof, argumentation, mm -hmm. whereas the intellectus is actually more receptive. Seeing. It's contemplative. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens here is something that is still truly and deeply intellectual, but it turns people into contemplatives for a moment mm. when they hear stories, they receive wisdom that isn't in the form of a, a moral argument or a proof. Yeah. And I think it sometimes goes much deeper and lasts much longer. Well, I, Both are needed, yeah. but I think right. these stories yeah. belong in conferences where scholars gather, right. as well as you know, in the, in the living room where people are watching it. it, it it's what we call a Marian comprehension yes. of, of reality and openness, Pondered on a those virginal things. receptivity to being. That, that's why Bernanos pronounced Mary younger than sin. Yeah. There was a that's spring in her step. Thing. She was always looking forward to a new day. Nothing is more beautiful than to begin. And your mother is like that. She's beyond sin. She's older than sin. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. She's living uh, paradise in yeah. a way. Yeah. I mean, one of the glories of heaven will be to wake up and discover all the good that you did and all the good that you received, but you weren't aware of Amen. or grateful enough for. Amen. Uh, you won't want to miss the last segment of Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. St. Francis, we know, was a realist, and when he first formed the order, it was very limited in personnel, and most of the people were relatively young and, and very useful and productive. But then Francis realized as the order was growing that there was a need to be concerned about the aged and the sick in their midst. And so we know he always uh, recommended that whenever there was someone sick or old within their midst, that they needed all the care all the solicitude that the order could provide for them because we need to value them uh, not only when they're very useful to the order but even when perhaps they cannot contribute. But they have in the past and we need to value that and to make sure that we always have all the care and maintenance that they need. I'm in the 4 plus 1 program here for counseling. It is very academically challenging, but the classes are a lot of fun. The teachers do love what they teach, and they know their fields very well. If you're interested in mission, that's a big thing here. I did San Diego for two years. That was a youth ministry mission. There are a lot of opportunities here to be actively pro-life, praying outside the abortion clinic. There's a big group that goes to the March of Life here from campus. There's just so much you can do as far as faith goes. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. This is our final segment. We've been talking about the theology of aging uh, with Dr. Janet Smith. Uh, Regis, could you start us off? Yeah. Uh, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, I think, uh, is Pope John Paul II. I mean, we haven't really talked about his own experience of aging, which became highly instructive mm -hmm. for an entire world. I mean, he had the universe as his audience. And uh, the besetting uh, question that really preoccupied him and the larger church in the last 
months, years of his life was, is this guy going to govern us from a wheelchair <laughs> or from a papal throne? And, and the answer is by example, mm -hmm. not so much precept, but by example, the example of his suffering. That became sort of a way of life, his profession, his vocation. I, I, I think of Thomas Merton's uh, eulogy, uh, which he wrote for Flannery O'Connor. He said, her pen had been dipped in pain and that she reminded him of no other writer, not Hemingway or Faulkner, but that you had to reach all the way back to Sophocles uh, to mm. get mm. some comparison. She suffered. Mm. John Paul II suffered. And, and he, he put into practice, I think, the admonition that Jesus spoke to St. Peter when he told him, you know, you're going to be taken someplace where you do not wish to go, bound. Uh, and you're not eager to go there, but that is your salvation. That's your mission. Uh, and, and the Pope was taken to that place. He could no longer speak, no longer function, but he could teach by example. And I think that's what the very old, and maybe not so old, but the broken, the decrepit, have to teach us how to live, how to suffer, how to die. I mean, that's that's an imperishable lesson. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't get it in a university. You can't buy it at Walmart, but, but you can receive it and teach it. Mm -hmm. But you have to go there. Mm -hmm. That's the journey. Mm -hmm. And it awaits, I think, all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Regis. Scott? You know, there in John 21, the statement is added, thus he said to show by what death he would glorify God. Yeah. You know, and it really was in his yeah. death that John Paul yeah. glorified God. I remember the first time I met him was exactly on the one month anniversary of my dad's death. And uh, I, was, I wasn't even sure if I could get over the grief enough to go. And so I just, I, I, I told him I loved him and then I just gushed and told him my father died a month ago. And he just grabbed me and uh, looked into my eyes and said, I'll pray for him, you know. And I just melted. It was an amazing experience because one month earlier, you know, my dad was in his mid 60s, but he was older than my mom is now in her late 80s. Mm because he had been you know, afflicted with the illness, but also with a kind of depression that travels through the generations in my family. But he found God in his mm -hmm. suffering. And I remember the humiliation of him in the hospital where I had to shave him because the nurses were too busy and he didn't want me to even pick up the razor. I'm like, Dad, you changed my diapers. It's the least I could do. Mm -hmm. And that was his epiphany. And within a matter of weeks, I was reading the Psalms. He never read the Bible or wanted anybody to read. Mm -hmm. I was praying with him and he was telling me he was praying for the first time in his life, you know, I just wouldn't put it past God to do certain things that you've waited all your life to see happen to your parents, mm -hmm. but it's in their suffering, in their humiliation. Not only do they get graces that you never thought might come, but so do you. Yeah. And this is why the stories, along with the arguments, you know, but especially the stories, the real life experiences that convey not just Torah, law, but hakma, wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's what our society needs, and that's what the church is going to be to our society, what the soul is to the body, mm -hmm. and reanimating the sense that euthanasia is just stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so true. Thank you, Scott. Janet? Yes, I, I, I want to comment on your, your emphasis on stories. I mean, we've all been telling a lot of stories here, and, and my generation and, and my life has been trying to make the better argument. And we, yeah. we loved hearing arguments, we loved debates, and even those of us who were relativists and everything, we went to the debates because we actually thought, deep down, or somebody might win and I'd learn a truth. And we really did change our lives because we heard truth was argued. Whereas uh, my impression of the, of the current generation in many ways, um, they don't want debate. They don't want argument. Um, they, they just, they think, all right, you're passionate about abortion one way, you're passionate another, who's to say? And it just creates conflict and we don't need that. So you have your views and I'll have my views. And I honestly think a huge reason for that there's probably many, 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 but a huge one is divorce. And that so many kids are growing up in divorce households and they don't want uh, any more conflict. Yeah. They've got They've heard conflict passion their, arguments. Yeah, and they older. don't, and you know, I don't want to say dad's right or mom's right, they're both right. right. You know, I, I, don't want to have to, <laughs> I don't want to have to decide. So I think it just uh, filters into their life. So I've been trying to talk to my seminarians about this. You know, we're in a, mo most of us teach to the problems that we had in our youth. And I'm trying to keep current and try to think about what is it that young people are wrestling with now that might be different from what my age was, this, was wrestling with. And I think a lot of it is, a, is this. It's divorce. It's abortion. It's all this. And I think Pope Francis has got this, that there's wounded people out there. 
and what the church has is um, it's a field hospital. Yeah. But the way to get people is not by beating them over the head with an argument, but by touching them somehow with a story. A, a story that between you and this person where you come together and they see that you understand what they feel and what they experience. And a lot of these young people do love their grandparents because it's the only point of stability they've had in their lives. Yeah. So there's, there's, in this realm, you can get that you could go in that direction often with young people about euthanasia assisted suicide. Well, even Peter Singer, you know, who was um, thought human life didn't have any value unless it was highly functional. Um, his ethics books is used more than any other ethics book in uh, secular universities. And he argues that at a certain people, time when people have outworn their usefulness, you know, assisted suicide euthanasia would be permissible, except for his mother, who he's been paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep care for every year. Right. And he was asked about that. How can you live with this inconsistent? He said, well, it's different when it's your mother. Wow. <laughs> I mean, it, wow. again, and that's where, uh, you know, a life experience can, can challenge a, a right. principle right. powerfully. Yeah. And so I think telling the stories is extremely important because it puts a human face on the arguer. And then they're more open to the argument. You say, this is, this is how I've lived, this is how I feel, you and I feel the same thing about the situation. Now these are the principles that it are, whether we know it or not, are, are governing our behavior. Mm -hmm. So I think the arguments have to come. People need those arguments for also right. fortify them, understand, help other people. But I think we have to become terrific storytellers. That's, what, yeah, that's our job. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Nice thank you for you. Uh, both your, your work as a scholar and professor, but just the, the witnessed example well, of you. love uh, is a, a beautiful thing. Um, if you've enjoyed today's program, uh, we have a, a handout that Dr. Smith put together for us, excerpts on the church's documents on aging. You can get this just for asking um, or for download at faithandreason.com. This is available for you. A great uh, primer or uh, going a little deeper into our topic. Um, all of us will have or are right now dealing and caring for those who are aging. Um, and I think we need to start today uh, with our vocation. Our vocation is love. Uh, our vocation is our path to holiness. And as, as Dr. Smith pointed out, it, it's, it's that journey of giving of ourselves, knowing it's about someone else and not about us and practice. Uh, the example of, that we pass on to our children or grandchildren, start early, start young, uh, bring them to uh, uh, old folks' homes or, or wherever, just to love, uh, to bring that out because there's so much wisdom and beauty uh, in the elderly. Um, thanks for watching uh, Franciscan University Presents. This program springs forth from the mission of Franciscan University, uh, which is to, to form the students who are going to go out and transform the world for Christ. We want to invite you to be a part of that mission uh, by coming to study here on campus or uh, online, getting your degree or classes. Maybe you want to join us at one of our, our dynamic summer conferences or exciting uh, pilgrimages here uh, and throughout the holy sites throughout the world. And go to um, faithandreason.com to be equipped and, uh, and ready for the new evangelization. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents, or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381, or call 740 Two eight three six three five seven.